Well, let's pray as we open our Bibles and uh, look at God's Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we open our Bibles, Lord, we're opening a book that the Holy Spirit inspired to be written many years ago, but which is so relevant for us today. Lord, help us to unpack and to find what is uh, the message for our hearts this morning and help us to put it into practice with your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, for those who are visitors, those who haven't been here for a while, we're going through the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. And uh, the book of Joshua uh, is recording history about 3,400 to about 3,500 years ago. So Moses has died, and the Israelites are now settling into the land of Israel. Uh, and this, this history of Joshua is about the Israelites taking over their land, the promised land, as it's called. And uh, battles have been won, and uh, land has been taken over and we come now to a settling period and there are these cities of refuge that are set up that Drew read about when we had that reading a short while ago. So the overall title for our message is Christ our Refuge because we'll see how it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship with him. But first of all I want you to imagine a society where there's little or no rule of law where everyone does what they can uh, does what they want to do and imagine uh, no rule of law especially when it comes to killing there's no law there's no due process there's no police there's no legal system well if someone is killed in a family well understandably feelings for justice are there because that's only right to feel justice should be done but those feelings are also caught up in the emotions and in the anger of what has happened in that killing and so killing, accidental or deliberate, leads to more killing. And it leads to more and more killing. Family blood feuds start. Tribal inter tribal fighting starts. It becomes, in effect, a kind of a wild west. Now, I'm sure you'd agree, I certainly wouldn't like to be in a society where blood feuds are rampant. It wouldn't be a nice place to be, would it, if this was going on? Now, when the people of Israel were uh, still wandering in the desert, God had given instructions for six cities of refuge. And in Numbers uh, 35 and uh, verse 10, it says this. When you cross the Jordan into Canaan, select some towns to be your cities of refuge to which a person who has killed someone accidentally may flee. They will be places of refuge from the avenger so that anyone accused of murder may not die before they stand trial in before the assembly. These six towns you will give to be your cities of refuge. Give three on this side of the Jordan and three in Canaan as cities of refuge. So three in the east, three on the west. These six towns will be a place of refuge for Israelites and for foreigners residing among them so that anyone who has killed another accidentally may can flee there. You'll notice the similarity between Numbers and the reading in Joshua because of course Joshua was fulfilling the commands that were there in Numbers and also repeated in Deuteronomy. The difference between murder and manslaughter is explained in that passage there in, in, the, in Numbers. And then in verse 33 of the same chapter, the value of human life is underlined by the, the reference to capital punishment. It says in verse 33, how the atonement cannot be made for the land on which blood has been shed except by the blood of the one who shed it. Well, one section in the message this morning is principles of justice and the value of human life. Principles of justice and the value of human life. Now these instructions that we get help to move a society away from blood feuds, away from rampant revenge, towards a justice based on the rule of law. So that's what we have here in this passage. Orderly justice is to replace rampant revenge. And I'm sure we would say that is a good thing. Now remember, this is 3,400 years ago. And we might think we're very clever in our society, wanting justice for all and so on, but we're not the people that first thought of it. God gave these instructions to Moses many years ago. The death penalty is still in force, and for those who are found guilty of murder, premeditated murder, and the reason why God gave Israel the death penalty for crimes such as murder is that human life is so precious. Human life is so precious. 
Even the accidental killing of someone brings a serious consequence, as we'll see. But there's the death penalty for premeditated killing. Now, it's nothing to do with the deterrent. Sometimes people say, well, the death penalty doesn't deter people. It's nothing to do with deterrence. The reason why God gives the death penalty is because it teaches us to value human life. It is so precious. Now, we're not meant to transfer the Old Testament law and kind of plonk it into our culture. We're not meant to do that. And I would be reluctant to campaign for the death penalty in our culture at this time. But it's so easy to lie, isn't it? It's so easy to spread false, fake news. Our legal system, I don't think, could be strong enough to cope with that. I think there need to be a lot of changes to our legal system before that could ever be uh, considered. But as I say, we're not meant to just take the Old Testament law and just plonk it straight into our society. But we do see a principle here that is for us to take on board. And that is that life is so precious, whether it's taken accidentally or whether it's taken deliberately. And there are serious consequences for taking life. An Old Testament example of manslaughter is when you're chopping wood. So imagine you're, you're working in the forest chopping some wood and your axe head comes loose. And then you're about to strike a, a, a log and your axe head flies off and kills someone nearby. It wasn't deliberate. You didn't commit murder. But do you regularly check your axe? Did you thoroughly check it this morning before you started working? A more modern day example, what about something as simple as checking our tires on our car? What could happen if we don't check our tires, if they're not in good condition? We wouldn't intend, intend harm, would we? If we use equipment or if our staff in our workplace use equipment, do we check it properly? Do we have a heart for people, for their safety? Life is precious. Life is precious. Now for accidental killing, or we call it manslaughter, there is an effect in here, in Joshua 20, a city arrest and detention within the city boundary. As long as the high priest is alive, if you accidentally killed someone, you were to flee to one of these refuge cities, one of these six refuge cities, and there you would stay if, as the elders of the city heard your case and acknowledged that it was uh, accidental, and uh, after the trial, it was acknowledged to be accidental, but you had to stay in the city, in the refuge city, until the current high priest died, and then you could go home free. So I suppose if there was a healthy high priest who had just taken office, you could be there for quite a long time. But the alternative, if you were to be gotten by the avenging relative, well, that would be worse, wouldn't it? One of the, the kind of principles in this is a, a proportionate penalty. A proportionate penalty. The punishment is to fit the crime. You may have heard what some people call a contradiction in the Bible, they would refer to Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, and so on. And, uh, well, it says there, You have heard that it was said, Eye for an eye, and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And this is Jesus saying it. So Jesus is contradicting the Old Testament. There's clearly a contradiction in the Bible. Well, no. There's no contradiction there. You see, the Old Testament, when Jesus said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, he was referring to the Old Testament law, which is to do with the, the national legal system of Israel. That was, in Jesus' day, wrongly used to justify revenge. That's the point that Jesus was getting at. You're using an Old Testament law about state law to justify your personal revenge on other people. So Jesus is correcting a misuse of the Old Testament law. What Jesus is saying is, how he wants us to react as Christians, in Christian individuals, when we're offended or slighted. So an eye for an eye is establishing the principle of proportionate punishment for the state of Israel in the Old Testament times. Not that you literally have to always do the same back to the other person, but the principle is that punishment is to be in proportion with a crime. There was a limiter. And the refuge cities were to limit the punishment. Someone kill someone, it was an accident. They're not guilty of murder, it 
was manslaughter. There's a difference, and there's a proportionate punishment. So the cities of refuge were part of this proportionate system of legal justice pulling back from a wild west society, which I'm sure we would not like to live in. It's also, also to do with fair trials. Joshua chapter 20 and verse 4, it says this. When they flee, the person who's accidentally killed someone, when they flee to one of these cities, they are to stand in the entrance of the city gate and state their case before the elders of that city. Then the elders are to admit the fugitive into their city and provide a place to live among them. It's to do with fairness, with hearing the case, fairness in trials. Numbers 35 uh, says something similar. Numbers chapter 35 and verse 9. That says, the Lord says to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into Canaan, select some towns to be your cities of refuge, to which a person who has killed someone accidentally may flee. They will be places of refuge from the avenger, so that anyone accused of murder may not die before they stand trial before the assembly. So trials are to be fair. Justice is to listen. Justice is to establish the facts. And without fear or favor, justice is to do the right thing, having heard the facts. Now the avenger, imagine you're the avenger. Imagine you're the one who's had someone in your family killed accidentally or maybe deliberately. Well, you're not in any mood to listen to the evidence. You'll probably be in no mood to weigh up the facts. And the avenger will just want avenge, uh, vengeance. But justice says something different. Justice says stop. Justice listens. Justice establishes the facts as far as possible. Deliberates and decides. There's a, an interesting uh, command in the Old Testament and this just shows how uh, the principles of justice, I know our society, uh, our legal system has a lot to criticise, but uh, many of the, the good things in our law system, which other countries, some other countries don't have, are based on principles in the Bible. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. One witness cannot establish any iniquity or sin against a person, whatever that person has done. A fact must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So there, needs, there need to be witnesses. There needs to be more than one witness to establish a fact. So it needs to be fair. There needs to be fair justice. And in general, we need, the application for us is this. We're not judges or magistrates, at least I don't think any of us are. But in our daily lives, we need to be slow to speak. We need to be quick to listen. We need to be patient to judge. And fair in the application of justice. There's a principle here that we need to take on board. In James chapter 1, and verse 19, uh, we see the instructions there from a New Testament apostle and the principle carried on here. James 1 verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Anger itself is not wrong, but it's what we do with our anger. It's how we express our anger it's whether we think before we speak, before we act with our emotions. Are we, am I too quick to come to, into a situation, if you like, bulldozing in, charging in, like an avenger? Do we do that too much? Do we pause to consider? Do we pause to establish the facts and make wise decisions? As I said earlier, anger itself is not wrong. Anger is a righteous response when there's injustice and when there's evil taking place. But pause. Why am I angry in this situation? What is the best way to express my feelings in the situation? Am I angry at sin, at something, at an injustice done? Do I want to see wrong put right and people reconciled? Or am I just miffed because I'm not getting my own way? There's a difference, isn't there? How many times sometimes to see that thing? Another principle that comes through here under this uh, uh, general principles of justice and the value of human life is justice for all. We see here in this passage in Joshua 20, written three, nearly three and a half thousand years ago, we see the principle of access to refuge and justice 
for all. Now, ask the question, where were these cities of refuge? Well, there were three west of the Jordan and three on the east of the Jordan. And there's a map, and we see the, the various tribal territories of Israel and the various cities of uh, refuge scattered through. And apparently, there was a, everyone was in the territories of Israel was in around about 32 miles of a city of refuge, the way they uh, spaced them throughout the country, about 32 miles away from any city of refuge. Now, going back to the time when Moses was alive, in, uh, going back to Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 19, and verse uh, 2 to 4. Deuteronomy, yeah, Deuteronomy 19, and uh, verse 2 to 4. It says, Set aside for yourselves three cities in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. It says there are determined distances involved or that can be translated, prepare the road, prepare the pathway. So determine the distances involved and divide into three parts of the land the Lord your God is giving you as the inheritance so that a person who kills someone may flee for refuge to one of these cities. This is the rule concerning anyone who kills a person and flees there for safety. Anyone who kills a neighbor unintentionally without malice or forethought, and then it talks about later on three more cities are to be set up. Uh, later on but so in total there were the six cities and the the distances between from the cities uh, to the territory was to be worked out the, the ways were made clear and measured and so we see that there was access provided for people throughout the territory of Israel to be able to get to a place of refuge in the situation where someone was accidentally killed so these cities were, were planned these cities were spread out through the territory and these cities were thought out and they were thought out in order to enable people to get to the refuge quickly and safely now the refuges as well as being geographically uh, close to where people lived they were also open to all people to Israelites and also any foreigners living in Israel if you look at Joshua 20 verse 9 it says any of the Israelites or any foreigner residing among them who killed someone accidentally could flee to these designated cities. So again, as we've seen before, as we've gone through Joshua, there is an international concern that God has to embrace all peoples. So not just Israelites, there's no nationalism here that uh, excludes other people, but people who've come from other nations to live in Israel were included in this legal system. And so, as God's heart is there to embrace people of all nations, so our hearts need to be broad and embracing to other peoples of other nations. Again, where were these places of refuge? Well, when you look at the lists of where the priests had their cities, these six cities were six of the 48 cities where priests were given uh, to, to live. So, six, these, six of these cities were in amongst the, the priests. Now, if the priests were doing their job, if the priests were fulfilling their role, they would be scripture teachers, wouldn't they? They would be those who would be understanding and reading and checking out the law of God. They would be, if they were doing their job, living godly lives, wouldn't they? Because that's a priest's job in the Old Testament there, to represent God, to teach and to represent. And also they would be involved on a rotor basis going to the, the place of worship, it was a tent temple to start with, and later on it was a, a stone temple, where the priest would minister there, sacrifices would be made, offerings would be given, and where people could come and approach God through the, the ministration of the priest. And so to be living in a priest city would to be amongst people who know what was written of the Bible then, to be amongst people who would hopefully be putting it into action, to be amongst people who would be involved with the things of God. And so in that sense, it would be a godly place to be, a blessed place to be, nearer to the word of God, nearer to people who knew a lot about God. And so these cities were a place of detention, but also a place of help, a, ha a place where people could get to know God, where people could get closer to him. And so even though it was a detention, it was a place of restoration, reformation for anyone who took God seriously there. 
Well, Joshua obeys and selects these six cities of refuge and they are put in place. Practical applications, applications for our law, for our, the way we look at people, the way we treat people, and so on. But let's look at some pictures of Jesus, our refuge. Pictures of our Savior. Let's think about the church, what we are. The church, we see, I, I, I see in this passage, there's a picture of us that we need to host a city of refuge. We are to host the city of refuge today. A church community needs to be like a city of refuge because the Lord Jesus Christ is amongst us and he's the ultimate refuge. He's the refuge that all these six cities are pointing to, are speaking of. People used to use a sanctuary, in, uh, a church building as a sanctuary in the olden days, didn't they? So you get in some films and uh, some, some books about people going to a church building to find sanctuary, particularly in medieval times, and uh, trying to, be, uh, to escape from someone who's after them, seeking sanctuary in a church building. But we know that the church is not a building, it's people. We're in a village hall, but this is a church, because we're God's people meeting together. Now our role, well, in the Old Testament, the priests hosted these cities of refuge. And it's where the, the law and where the truth was upheld. Where a welcome was offered to a seeker of refuge. Where someone could run and escape after making a terrible mistake and find a refuge, find justice, find a place of safety from the avenger. And all Christians, we all, if we're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a, a priestly role. We're to host this city of refuge. This is a place of refuge for those who are running away seeking God. In Revelation chapter 1, we see that we are a kingdom of priests. God has made us to be a kingdom. So in the Old Testament, it was just certain people who could be priests. But in the New Testament era, we all have a priestly role. We all have a role to represent, to pray for others, to live out the Christian life as good examples. One, uh, ch first chapter of Revelation, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. We're a kingdom and priests to serve our God. So our role is a priestly role. And, and the church is full of sinners. Are you not a sinner? I know I am. But if we've repented and put our faith in Jesus, we're a saved sinner, aren't we? We're saved sinners. So when others come to us, when other people come with their burdens and their troubles, some having made terrible mistakes, we need to be there for them. We need to clear the roads. We need to measure the distance. We need to make sure there's no obstacles in the way for people to come to hear the gospel amongst us. We should not make it hard for people to come here, to hear the good news of Jesus. Now, we know the gospel itself is challenging, isn't it? You might not yet be a Christian and you might be wrestling with some of these things, these things that sound so weird and trying to grapple with them. And the gospel is challenging. It is. It confronts our pride. It, it kind of confronts and challenges the hold of sin on our lives. There are challenging truths to get our heart and head around. And we can't water it there. But the road to our door, the road to our lives, the road to access the refuge should not be blocked by unnecessary obstacles of prejudice in our hearts and behavior, by human traditions. And the Lord forgive us, if so, by being bad examples to others. We need to be priests who are doing our job, hosting the city of refuge. And if you've come here this morning to find out more about the Lord Jesus Christ, find out more about Christianity, we're so glad you've come here. We hope you haven't had any obstacles on the way physically. And we hope there's no obstacle in our, from us to you being here. We hope you're welcomed. The message is challenging. We can't deny that. But we hope and pray that you'll have received a welcome from us. And we hope that you'll see the beauty of Jesus as a refuge for your soul. When people come to the door of our lives, we need to listen to them, don't we? Like the elders of the city of refuge were to listen to the people, to listen to the case of the person who's running away from the avenger. And if someone is not trying to get away with murder, literally or figuratively, but they have a repentance-seeking heart, we should welcome them. We should give them a refuge. Show them a godly life. Show them a, a godly love. Teach them God's word. Introduce them to Jesus, who is our refuge. 
in contrast to the Old Testament, because there are contrasts here, of course, we're not called by Jesus to try to create a Christian state or theocracy. That is a mistake that some Christians down the years have tried to do, tried to mix church and state, and it's always gone wrong. It's always ended in, in trouble. We're not to do that. We're not to try to enforce our values upon the community, no. Instead, we're to show our values. We're not to enforce them, we're to show our values. We're to demonstrate the life, that life and justice are highly valuable to us. That God's truth and justice are highly valuable to us. That others, that their lives are valuable to us. Now, of course, if you're a Christian lawyer or politician or magistrate, then Christian values will shape your leadership. However, every Christian, all of us in our everyday lives, we can show that life and truth and justice are highly valued. How do we do that? How we treat people. How we value people. How we tell the truth. Is truth important to us? How we care for the weak and the vulnerable. In James chapter 1, the Apostle James says there, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. How we care for the weak and the vulnerable, for the refugees as they come to our lives, whether literally to our door here or whether into our lives. How do we show these things? How we embrace the foreigner residing among us. Joshua 20, verse 9. It wasn't just for the Israelites, it was for the residing foreigner. Justice for all. Then, of course, there's the, the role of the, the, the high priest, the role of the high priest. The refugees who came to the city, they were seeking refuge if they were shown to be manslayers instead of murderers they were to be given refuge in the city but they were to stay there and they were to stay there for the duration the rest of the life of the high priest current high priest now what's the high priest well the high priest was obviously in charge of all of the other priests as you can uh, understand and his job was to particularly represent the people especially to offer sacrifices all through his life in the tabernacle and then the temple and it says that when he dies, there is freedom for all those people who are currently in the refuge cities. So imagine all the, the people in the refuge, and uh, of course they're priest cities, and the news gets round, the, the grapevine gets round that the current high priest is, has died. And then all the people that are in those cities, they're in detention, are then allowed to go free. Go to their homes, the avenger of blood cannot touch them, even if there's still animosity back in their hometown, they're not allowed to do anything to them, they're free to go back home. Imagine all the people leaving those cities at the news of the death of the high priest. Jesus, he combines the role of high priest and also the offering. Jesus is the high priest, but he's also the lamb. He's the one who is now the final, once and forever priest. We don't need any more priests like him. Like, like we did in the Old Testament times. He's the full and final culmination of that priestly system. And he's also the Lamb. Because as was pointed out, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the high priest who offered himself the final high priest. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, tells us about that there. It says that Christ, our high priest, has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And that is the heart of Christianity. That God's son, Jesus, came to offer himself and through his offering, through his death, to save us from our sins so that we can go free. Free of guilt. We can walk out of detention. We can go free before God. Guilt Free. So those who believe in Jesus are set free, set free from the righteous avenger of all sins. And of course that's God, who is the only true, just and righteous and pure avenger of all sins. We can go free now because through the offering and death of Jesus our Savior, our sins are paid for. We can go free, justified. Or as, as it has often been said, just as if I'd never sinned. Isn't that amazing? That we can live our lives through Jesus, just as if I'd never sinned freedom 
in John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus talking about the truth that he brings, the truth that he is. He says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Christian truth sets people free from guilt, from fear of death, from fear of God, from fear of even other people because we now have a strength and a rock in our lives, a refuge that gives us strength and courage in the face of a hostile world. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 tells us, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, that's faith in Jesus, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So through faith in Jesus, we are justified, we have peace with God. We are brought into relationship with God. We are free. The high priest has died. He offered himself. And we can go free. Now, unlike the high priest in the Old Testament, and unlike those poor lambs, Jesus, our high priest, and our lamb rose again from the dead. He conquered death. And he lives forever to intercede for us. So not only do we have someone who died so we can go free, but someone who rose again, who is alive, that we can have a relationship with now, who is praying for us, who is interceding for us, who is defending us, who is our lawyer now, who in the court of heaven says, they're forgiven. I paid for their sins. They're mine. I love them. Hebrews 7 verse 24 but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So if we have come to God through Jesus, we are forgiven. We have a permanent representative before us. He saves completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede. So our freedom... And our new life in Christ, when we become a Christian, is eternal because we have an eternal high priest. We have an eternal Savior. And so Jesus Christ is our refuge. He is our refuge. All these the ideas of refuge and thoughts of, of justice and so on, they, they, they all point to Jesus ultimately. Now let's think about it. Who ultimately is sin against? If I offend you, then I've sinned against you. But there's a greater sin that I have committed, not just sinning against a fellow human being, but against an almighty God who loves you, who holds your life precious, who made you in his image. So if I sin against you, I am insulting the image of God. And that is, if you like, the, the heart of why murder is so bad, why prejudice is so bad, why hatred of other people is so bad. Because yes, other people are faulty and they let you down, but they're made in the image of God. The answer is not to murder and to hate, is it? But the ultimate avenger of sin, of course, is God. Because he is the one that sin is ultimately against. And he is our judge, as well as father, as well as shepherd, as well as his wonderful images of who God is. He is ultimately the judge of the cosmos. The universe was made according to God's rules. And God rules the universe according to his law. And he will hold us to account. He is the only just true sin-free avenger and yet what does it god do what does the lord do he provides refuge for us in his son isn't that amazing that you would have thought the avenger would just be sent out or go out on to avenge but this one who is the one who is actually the one that we have sinned against and who has the right to condemn us he's the one who actually has provided a refuge for us in his son so the thing is this there is refuge, it's in Jesus. But we need to go to him, don't we? We need to run away to Christ for this refuge. And so the answer is run to him, go to him today. If you're not yet a Christian, go to him, run to him. Don't slow down, the way's clear. It's only 32 miles physically in Israel, but it's only a prayer now for you to get to the city of refuge, for you to get to Christ. Run to the city of refuge. Jesus is the eternal high priest. He never dies. He's always there for you. He's here for you right now this morning. And it, he provides a refuge that lasts forever. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 tells us, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're out of Christ, you're in an area where there's condemnation. If you're in Christ, you're in a place of refuge. You are in a safe place. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In the Old Testament, the refugee had to stay in the city, didn't they? 
until the high priest died. That could be varying lengths of time. And then the refugee was free to go without fear. But in Christ, our refuge, our hearts are, in a sense, wonderfully trapped, aren't they? We, we, we have to come and go in our daily lives. We have to do our daily duties, work, school, studies, whatever it is, domestic duties, whatever it might be. But in our hearts, we're always bound to be with Christ, aren't we? Our hearts are always in the city of refuge. Our hearts are always in him. We find ourselves wanting to go back closer to him. Although we're, we're free to, to go out and about and do our stuff, we want to get closer to him. We want to be at the epicenter of where he is. And so there's a kind of a freedom to go, in a sense, when we become a Christian. But actually, we want to get closer to him. We don't want to go from the city of refuge. It's like those people who went to the city of refuge in the Old Testament times, and they got to know the priest, and they got to see the situation, and they got to love God more and more. And so when the time came, when the high priest died, uh, you can imagine some of them wanting to stay there. They settled there. They found friends and, and got close to people there and saw it as a blessed place to be. And that's like when we become a Christian. We are free, but we love Jesus so much. We don't want to go far away from him. We want to stay close to him. We are wonderfully trapped. We, we find ourselves wanting to keep going back, to learn from his word, the Bible, to get close to him day by day. And we find that Jesus is a place we want to go to, that we need to go to in all circumstances. Proverbs 18, verse 10 says, The name of the Lord is a fortified tower, the righteous run to it and are safe. And we find ourselves running to the tower, running to the tower, don't we? Because we love our Savior, our refuge. Where do we go when we're stressed? Where do we go when we're tempted? Where do we go when we fail? Where do we go when things are going well? Where do we go when we're desperate? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Sometimes when we're stressed, we run around like headless chickens, we hurt ourselves, one way or another banging into this and that. When we're tempted, where do we go? When we fail, do we punish ourselves? Do we self-harm in some way? We don't need to do that. We go to our refuge. We come to him. He says, I forgive you. you. All your sins. Be free. Where do we go when things are going well? He loves to hear us say thank you. Often does the Lord help us and answer our prayers and we forget to go back to him and say thank you, Lord. When we're desperate, we have a refuge. There was a time in John, John's Gospel, chapter 6, when people were, were leaving Jesus because as he was teaching, he was getting, if you like, to the heart of the, the Christian message and some people found it too, too challenging. And so there were big crowds following Jesus. They, they wanted the miracles, wanted the the bread and the fish and so on, wanted to be with him for those things. But when they were kind of thinking about what he was saying, a lot of people left and, you know, that does happen, of course. And Jesus says to his disciples, to the core of disciples, he says, do you not want to leave me too? Simon Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. nowhere else to go, nowhere else we really want to go when we know Jesus is our refuge. So then, action plan, what are we going to do about all this? Well, we've seen that there are principles of justice and the value of human life in this passage. Think and pray about that. How can you in this week apply the principles of justice and the value of human life that we see in this passage and how you interact with people, how you embrace people who may be on the outside of society, people who are feeling left out, where there is a situation maybe where you're likely to go in like a, a bull in a china shop, are we going to pause, listen, weigh things up, act fairly and justly in that situation? When we're angry about something, are we going to act upon our anger because it's, we're not getting our own way? Or will we listen, stop, think? pray, act along the lines of the principles of justice 
and the value of human life. And we've also seen the pictures of Jesus, our refuge here, haven't we? Is Jesus your refuge? Have you run to him yet? You might think you're, you're 10,000 miles away from him, but actually in reality, you're a prayer away from him. You might have run for years and years throughout your life, but he's just there behind you. You just have to turn around and accept his embrace. He's the refuge for all who repent of sin and trust in him. So we pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to help us to put into practice the principles of justice and the, the value of human life in how we live in this coming week. Father, we ask that you would help us to run to Jesus for our refuge. Help us, Lord, as Christians, to keep going back to our refuge. If we've not yet ever come to him, help us right now by the power of your Holy Spirit to see our need and to run to him right now. I pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.